Um, actually, yes, but I am standing here to present uh, ICANN and uh, Mabara, which is the consultancy firm that I work with. Uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Changing the Dynamics of Niger in Relevance and Implications for that for Pastoral People's Livelihoods. And I'm uh, using the case study of uh, Kajiado County. <coughs> Quick introduction, um, pretty much laying out what the arid and semi arid areas in Kenya look like. They make 80% of the landmass. Uh, 23 out of the 47 counties in the country are, cl are classified as uh, arid and semi arid uh, landscapes. Uh, they host about 4 million people, a population of more than 10% of the country. And uh, this population uh, is growing uh, and expanding from the more Arab lands into the more rural areas. Um, some of the key issues to highlight about arid and semi arid areas uh, or residents uh, in Kenya is that they provide habitat for wildlife conservation and uh, livestock based livelihoods. Um, these areas, as Ole Kaunga has spoken about, uh, have been historically marginalized and uh, not seen much of development, but in recent times they've seen more recognition and development from policy makers. Uh, in terms, I mean ecologically or in terms of climate, um, these areas are, are recording uh, changes in, in rainfall and increases in temperatures. These are implications on uh, livelihoods and uh, wildlife species. Um, in terms of economic importance of these areas or the livestock sector in the arid and semi arid areas, 12% uh, contribution to the GDP of the country, 42% uh, uh, contribution to agricultural GDP, 23% um, of the total population of the country depending on livestock for their livelihood and 50% uh, contribution to agricultural labor force. And then, with just to highlight the importance of pastoralism uh, in this sector, 80% uh, contribution by pastoralists to Kenya total livestock numbers, 70% population of livestock from the arid and semi-arid areas, and then 11 million people uh, being pastoralists to own livestock, and um, from some econometric studies, uh, the value of that is 4.2 USD. Yeah. Uh, in 2009, uh, what the livestock sector contributes to the country. Um, let's turn to the land China issue. Uh, Michael, lawyer, is quite vast about this. The Kenyan <laughs> legal framework now recognizes uh, three forms of land ownership, private land, public land, and community land. Those are the main three categories. Private land is usual private land individually owned or by a corporate entity governed by those laws. Public land is government owned uh, by the people but held by government in trust. These will include protected areas, their forests, roads, schools, and things like that. And then community land is where most of the rangeland lands lie in. This is what we call communal land, land that is not private, but it's not public. And uh, it's still an amorphous um, category of land ownership because it's in transition and uh, those are the laws that apply and uh, most of the range lands uh, fall in that category. Let's focus on Kajado County. Uh, that's the map of Kenya and that's where Kajiado is, this small corner there, for those who have not been to Kenya. And uh, these are the sub-counties uh, that form Kajiado County. It's the other home of the Maasai people, uh, the other county that has Maasai people being Narok County up in the north of Kajiado. And uh, just from a study that I've carried over the last two years, some of the trends uh, in Lantena, uh, major trends in Lantena 
uh, with implications on livelihoods um, in the county. Uh, one, fragmentation and enclosure of pastures and reduced range resilience and productivity. Uh, because of land tenure reforms, growing populations, we've seen over time a uh, shift from customary tenure to formal communal land tenure uh, group ranches. That's the first thing. And then from the group ranches of the communal tenure to private individual tenure. Basically fragmentation and uh, individuation and privatization of land. This has had implication in terms of resilience of the land and uh, its ability uh, for utilization in production, particularly in livestock production. And uh, it's also created a situation of vulnerability to, to climate change and other livelihood and, and production risks like floods and what have you. Uh, this also has created opportunity for investment in land. Uh, but of course with consequent threats to pastoralism, wildlife conservation and tourism. So there are winners and losers. Winners being incoming communities, non-pastoralists who are looking for space to invest uh, in land and places to settle. Uh, but losers being people who depend on land for productivity. That's the first trend. The second trend is uh, shown by that photo there is poor land use planning and uncontrolled growth of settlements, industries, and urban areas. Because of the proximity of Kajiado County to the city of Nairobi, uh, population <coughs> pressure is moving towards Kajiado. And because of poor planning, lack of zonations, and um, spread of settlement areas and industries, uh, you find that kind of development happening. And uh, in the absence of comprehensive land use plans to govern such growth, then you're having rapid land use uh, changes happening in the county. And um, that has serious implications. The county government is reacting by now, developing um, county uh, spatial plans and uh, land zoning regulations, but it might be too late into the game. Uh, that uh, trend is land commoditization in sales, which is leading to land insecurity and conflicts. Um, again, because of the pressure that I've explained, um, uh, land fragmentation uh, has opened ways for land selling. Uh, so land has become sort of like a commodity that you buy today and sell in two weeks' time or something like that, as opposed to uh, factor of production. Uh, because of the profits and um, the pressure associated with that, it has opened up for a lot of conflict, first at the family level, husbands selling lands without their wives or families knowing, uh, people selling land, fraudulently having land title deeds changed uh, illegally. There's a lot of insecurity and conflict involved around that. But that has, I mean, but it has not excluded communal and, um, uh, and other areas that have not yet been privatized. There's too much pressure. And just um, a feeling that you can play around and take land right away and sell and make profit in the process. Last trend, um, big trend, is loss of communal holdings and encroachment into protected and conservation areas. Uh, to link this to their first um, uh, observation on land fragmentation. This is what now you see. Uh, the county used to be largely group run <coughs> or, or communal. Now 64% of the county <coughs> is privatized. Group ranches or communal areas only make up 20%. And um, those that are in transition are about 8% and 4% is under this sold to a mining company that I talked about earlier. So that's how land is changing. And uh, we see these shrinking and these reducing. And this in a county that uh, requires mobility because it's largely arid and semi-arid. Uh, and uh, the main forms of subsistence are livestock and land-based activities like agriculture and tourism. Uh, what are the implications of these uh, 
for livelihoods and on Maasai communities. Um, land, land tenure changes from open landscapes to private individual holdings have uh, created serious obstacles to availability, mobility and access of livestock production to resources. Enclosures are making it impossible for people to move from one area to another and that has implications on um, livelihoods and their ability, say for example, to overcome shocks like droughts. The land tenure changes combined with the climate change has affected numbers uh, and distribution of livestock population. So livestock population, especially cattle, are going down. Livestock, national livestock trends show that like, numbers of cattle are going down, small ruminants is doing that, and that has implications on uh, the resilience of the land. Intensified exploitation of range resources, including overuse of critical resources, have caused range degradation and reduced productivity. Soil erosion, uh, because of overuse, is happening. Uh, and, um, uh, and when that happens, then there's less or reduced um, ability of the land to support livelihoods. Poverty and socioeconomic vulnerability is on the increase because of that. And pastoralists are increasingly being forced to diversify livelihoods and get into other economic activities. Uh, to conclude, uh, land tenor, what land led land tenor lessons uh, can we get for enhanced pastoral livelihoods and adaptation from what I've just described? I think one is that unrestricted land fragmentation and individuation of land and land cells, which I've just described, are constricting livestock production spaces and critical pastoral resources while limiting flexible mobility, which is necessary for coping with climate-related production shocks. So what is happening in the land context is limiting the ability of pastoralists to provide for themselves. Land tenure forms, uh, communal or individual, uh, determine what strategies or options communities pursue in adaptation and in land use investment. So one of the things that we see from the chart that I showed there is that uh, depending on how you own land, uh, then the options that you have that you can exercise to cope with particular challenges then is limited. Pastoralists who are in communal areas uh, use more of mobility, but those in private areas do not have, I mean, do not have much of that option. And then institutional arrangements that facilitate mobile reciprocal sharing of pasture resources between communities could reduce the impact of livelihood hazards g droughts to pastoralists. So this is to say that as much as land tenure changes have happened, what possibilities are there in terms of facilitating these communities to uh, utilize, say, mobility to cross railway lines and roads and things like that to access resources that they need. And then lastly is human and livestock population growth, a large number of small ruminants, goats and sheep and uncontrolled expansion of settlements are growing threats to sustainable land use in pastoral areas. I explained that cattle numbers are coming down, but sheep and goats numbers are going up, uh, which have more demand or which are intensive um, pasture users are increasing. And that has implications to you know, long-term um, ecological uh, pressure on pastoral areas. Land sales approval needs stringent controls to protect women and youth from dispossession through illegal land transactions. Uh, there's a common saying that Maasai people or uh, pastoralists or uh, people who are selling land are selling the future heritage of their children uh, because this land is being sold and it's going out of community control. What is the future? What are the future potential for children whose parents have sold all the land that they need for production and heritage? And then migration and changes in grazing management remain the most utilized strategies by pastoralists to cope with livelihood hazards, but the fragmentation and enclosure of pasture lands are inhibiting flexible mobility and exacerbating vulnerability to climate change. Um, I had explained that. So this is basically to show, highlight 
what I mean trends that has I mean started um, after independence and that accelerated after the creation of the group ranches and um, after that uh, the fragmentation of the group ranches to individual ranches and what is happening and the implications of that to communities that still rely on land um, as a way of I mean of production. So I think this sort of goes back to an issue that we talked earlier about. I mean, the uh, arrangements are there have shown the economic importance of these areas to national economies and the segment of populations that they support. But when you see the land tenure policies and or the trends that are happening in those areas, then you wonder how are these practices that have quite significant economic value are likely to continue. And with that, what will happen to the people who are there? I mean, uh, if these trends do continue. And uh, because, of course, in the context of climate change, then um, it becomes more difficult for them to uh, explore and utilize uh, customary or traditional coping mechanisms uh, because of, in, of challenges uh, brought about by plant and changes. Thank you. No, I was uh, <laughs> <laughs> can't see through the light there. No, sorry. John? So, Stephen, wonderful presentation. Uh, so much substance. Um, two questions. One is um, what is the role of urbanization, movement to small towns uh, in terms of the future of Masai Land? Uh, number two, if um, <coughs> we, we know that people usually uh, translate at, at the time of uh, drought and losing their, their livestock, in particular their, uh, uh, their cattle, they tend to invest in small stock. To what extent is the dynamic we're seeing here actually a response to, uh, a very rational response to the devastations and the droughts of the last uh, 10 years so that there is this sort of shifting in herd structures? Mm -hmm. Well, let's start with the role of organization. I think urbanization, uh, Kajiado County being very close to Nairobi, and uh, with a growing population, as I demonstrated, but which is not particular to Kajiado, but <coughs> to other principal areas, I think uh, urbanization is ex expected and, and naturally will happen under those conditions. Uh, the challenge of urbanization in Kajiado is that it's uncontrolled. So you have urbanization spilling to areas that ideally it should. We, you have housing settlements coming up in the middle of a well mapped out wildlife migration corridor or in the middle of a, I mean, I mean, rich pastoral grazing area and control, I mean, completely just because of the agency of uh, speculative settlement um, uh, developers with no consideration whatsoever of how that will be supported or uh, the ecological implications of that. Second question regarding if it's a natural reaction uh, to have shorts, I mean, sheep and goats as opposed to big stock. That, as you've noted, is uh, usually um, I mean, a way of, um, of coping. Like, you know, after drought, if you lose your cattle, then you start investing in small stock, and then you transition from small stock to livestock. I mean, large animals, cattle, or in other areas, to camel. And then usually from camel or cattle, they need to other more permanent investments like shops, um, education in children or other external investments. But what is happening here, uh, if you look at that with climate change modeling, which I've not been able to show here, uh, there are, um, I mean, people who've done the studies have shown that first, the increase in livestock species, uh, the small livestock species, is not 
the normal one. It's actually a curved straight line, which is increasing without normally, I mean, without showing that it's following a normal process. And uh, so it's going up while the cattle numbers are going down. And uh, that, the obvious explanation there is because of uh, the related uh, changes in land fragmentation. I mean, moving from that years ago where you had about 80% of the county being communal and mobility uh, being an option to a scenario that years later where less than 20 quarter of the land is open, then that's a, a <coughs> an obvious thing. And then the other thing is that uh, cattle take a little longer to regenerate. Uh, so with the successive droughts that we've had, cattle numbers, before they come and stabilize again, they are hit by another drought. Sheep and goats uh, are quick to reproduce. So those two factors, I think, explain the changes in the population trends of livestock mm. species in Kajiado. But most importantly, those trends, livestock population trends in Kajiado, also reflect what is happening uh, in some other areas, uh, arid areas uh, in the country, which face similar situations like Kajiado, namely uh, Narok and Nakibi. Mm. Uh, Colin had a question, and then we'll go back to Manuel. So I want to suggest a thought experiment in keeping with the model that we heard this morning about for indigenous conserved, an indigenous conserved territory where livelihood and the ecology of the larger community of life uh, are, are central in <coughs> the whole process of governance. And, um, so this would imply that Maasai society at some scale of organization, uh, but minimally at a sufficient scale of organization that an entire viable mobile pastoral range would be declared, would be self-declared by that society or segment of society to be sacrosanct as an indigenous conserved territory and that institutions involving land fragmentation, urbanization, uh, various resource extractive pressures uh, would um, uh, be illegitimate uh, and uh, uh, according to the governance of this territory uh, uh, excluded or, or at least at the very least very tightly regulated and localized so as not to interfere with the the manifest economic and ecological and livelihood benefits of extensive mobile grazing. You know, and we're, even in places like Western Canada, we're realizing that from an ecological perspective, the fencing of ranches is completely insane. We, we know now that, that the productivity of rangeland and the resilience of rangeland in times of drought is, 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 hugely uh, improved when mm, cattle are more, are, are more mobile and, and a few big ranchers who are experimenting with this are, are proving it. And, you know, um, but the trends that you're describing and the trends that have already completely overtaken the western Canadian rangelands um, are going in absolutely the wrong direction. You know. So what about a, an indigenous conserved territory self-declared, and this is a thought I realize that it's an extraordinarily naive program uh, because of all of the institutional forces arrayed against and, and, and established trends and, and already you, you, you're talking about major losses of, of accessible you know, communities. But what about that? Yeah, yeah. You know, what I, so th th that's not a, a new conversation. Uh, because this is public information and people are scratching their heads about that and people are seeing it, uh, that this trend is taking the community and the county to blame. Mm -hmm. 
we say that. And uh, with climate change, with more frequent droughts regularly, people are having to move wider and further and more often now. And uh, that has forced people to reconsider things that previously they didn't have to think about. So we have seen the 20% uh, group branches there that have not subdivided, becoming more resolute on, you know, uh, why they should not subdivide land. Most of the fragmentation that has happened there um, has, um, is not something that has happened in the last few years. Some few group branches uh, that are the ones that I've, uh, I have had put as in transition are uh, actually not uh, fragmented or subdivided because people are protesting and saying maybe that's not the way to go about it. One of the group writers, Toro Say, uh, where we worked with John and Carol uh, uh, in a previous research project, the youth went up in arms, went all the way to court, uh, saying that we don't want the land subdivided. Interestingly, uh, some individual landowners um, have actually started, um, we've started seeing signs of land being consolidated, I mean, consolidated. People with individual lands coming together and saying, well, let's assume that we don't have boundaries and use our land in common. I've seen evidence of that in my law. Um, we have the, cons the conservancies which are also coming up. Uh, I don't know if we'll get someone to talk about that because it's a major activity in Kenya now in land governance. And uh, it's a framework that is allowing community to, or, I mean, use land in common uh, for, conservation for conservation purposes, but also for livestock and livelihood um, support um, purposes. So they are aware, their awareness is there. Um, also, the county government has realized this, largely because of activities done by researchers like me and others. And uh, this year, they've come up with a land zoning plan, which now says that you cannot, in particular areas of the county, subdivide land to the level of, say, half an acre, that the minimum allowed is five acres and above just to control that land from, I mean, fragmentation process. Because we had a situation where you could go in the middle of a very arid area, have people subdividing land into quota acre. What possibility can you do with quota acre parcels of land in the middle of a dry area? So my hope, our hope, and the hope of future generations is that maybe just in the same way that these trends I mean, has been ongoing that way. Maybe the reverse is also possible in coming days as people realize the need for, uh, I mean, these traditional systems of, of land utilization. But um, I think even with land subdivision, people can still come into arrangements. Um, I mean, uh, people can still come into arrangements, uh, I mean, of sharing these resources and opening their boundaries. But now, with negotiations, and that's why I'm saying maybe institutional mechanisms can be uh, institutional mechanisms can be created, where which will allow for the movement of livestock as it's happening in other pastoral regions. I mean, in uh, in West Africa, where I had the opportunity to travel last year, uh, pastoral groups travel across countries, and people know that because of these and these particular groups will come. That does not mean a threat to their land, but they just use resources as they move around. And uh, I think the same could happen in Kenya as well. But it needs uh, discussion, uh, policy makers coming up with laws that enable this, but uh, I think it's going to be a tough walk. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful uh, presentation and the presentation by having a new entity there called Nabara. <laughs> That's great. I think the ideas of ICANN and the GEAR will be there and East Africa will benefit from that. So I have a, uh, just a question to follow up. Like uh, you said about the small stock is increasing and the large stock is decreasing. 
what effect that has to local economy. To the local economy? Yes. Okay. Uh, but also to the environment. Yeah, the ecology. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, as I said earlier, shipping routes are very intensive um, browsers. Like they will really go and pull the little grass out of the, um, the soil. So, uh, I mean, in pastoral areas, people know that if you want the tall grass, then you don't keep much sheep and goats. So they exert a lot of pressure on the land, so, and, uh, which makes it a little harder for the grass to grow when the rains fall. So in, in that regard, that's the direct impact. But in terms of livelihood, they are good because they would produce quickly. And um, um, it's an easier decision to sell a sheep or a, or a goat, as you know, than to sell a cow, um, or even to exchange it. And um, they, well, it's like they liquid cash for pastoralists. I mean, so, I mean, my mom li likes to call sheep and goats. It's like ready food, in, I mean, in the, in the house, because when you get the visitors, it's easy to catch a goat and slaughter and, and feed them. So it's easy for, I mean, for families to use it as a form of life, mm -hmm. as, you, as you know that. But um, uh, they are less secure as, uh, com compared to cattle, because a family with more cattle will feel more economically secure. Mm -hmm. And uh, diseases that kill sheep and goats will hardly kill cattle. So it's a sort of like a liquid, but more vulnerable livelihood asset as opposed to cattle. So usually you want to have a good balance of cattle and sheep and goats. Can I just add to the ecological? My question is, what data do we have? What, what, where are you basing this, this, these transformations? The ecological oh, transformations. I, like, I'm supervising a student right now who's trying to move into the satellite imagery and using these other types of data. And sometimes they're showing us that it's not quite what we anecdotally are, are hearing or, or thinking. And I'm so curious where, what, how confident you are in this 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 this. I'm uh, 100% confident uh, from two levels. One is from my personal experience and um, research, um, interviewing people, people will talk of, uh, we used to have this number of cattle, and now we have this number of cattle, and we used to have this number of sheep. So you actually now find a very rare situation in Kenya in among Maasai people where someone has only sheep and goats and not even a single cow, number one. Number two is data, um, the Department for Data, DRSDS, uh, does annual livestock uh, no, sorry, census. I'm talking environmental. 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 You said the rangelands are degrading and all this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, a good uh, uh, example and explanation of that and uh, of the papers that I can give is uh, longitudinal studies that have been done in Number City by David Weston, who is our copy I in uh, ICANN project, which basically just show, I mean, research done over the last four years, which show the changes in pasture levels, I mean, across four decades, and you can see totally. Despite the, the ups and downs, depending on long droughts and high rainfalls, the general trend is down. A four-year trend in the context of a drought actually doesn't uh, demonstrate mm -hmm. that. No, that's what I'm saying. 40 years. 40 years. You might be familiar with what that David Weston has done, which I got to use uh, last year when I was doing a land use planning uh, program for Mbirikani <coughs> in that area. And, um, this is like, when it's published in, I mean, uh, research, uh, which is quite well known globally, which demonstrates that. Yeah. What is the impact on the milk supply to the children when you have them coming from there? Of course, less cattle, less milk. That's a disaster. <laughs> it is. You mentioned at one point um, heritage. 
I think Colin also made a comment about uh, heritage sites and um, development going into heritage sites. And this might be an interesting opportunity to talk about how do we define heritage? How can we protect heritage? What is it? Is it land? Is it something, is it interaction between people and land? Or is it something that's isolated in a museum? How can, you know, in your case study, it's, it's very clear, and also in the um, study, um, this was a question on my mind that I had to Well, uh, land is heritage uh, because uh, uh, people live on land and people have culture. So if you dispossess the base uh, where culture is practiced, I mean the cultural landscape, uh, then you are losing the heritage of that. I mean, uh, communities of uh, particular association, I mean, their history is embedded in land, historical activities are embedded in, um, in particular spaces. And uh, when you privatize those spaces, uh, open them for possibilities of transfer through land sales, then basically what you're doing is selling the the future of future gener I mean the possibility of future generations to associate with those uh, historical um, um, I mean spaces. So I'll give you two quick examples. Uh, Maasai people mark. Um, generations through age groups and age sets and um, age sets and age groups have particular ceremonies uh, of graduation and initiation and the whole big festival areas called Amanyata which uh, every group in a particular area will say that we had our ceremony in a particular place and those are places that are referred to and they are like markers that you know you can just tell someone in a particular place where the ceremony of uh, age group A, B, C, D happen, and he'll know, I mean, he'll know automatically. So those are markers that are, are, well, are referred to, I could call them heritage sites. So when you have those dispossessed, <laughs> then they become owned by other people, then something else. Um, when you have uh, areas of uh, religious significance, um, like hills, uh, being taken away and made inaccessible uh, to communities, then you're also taking away the historical significance and um, people relations to such places. A good example is, uh, yeah, this is the second example is Lengon Hills that has been transformed into a public forest and now owned by the Kenya Forestry Services which now is, get, is giving out uh, parcels and leases uh, for wind power generation, hotel developers, <coughs> uh, disregarding the fact that that is uh, one, an area of dry season refuge for livestock, but also um, a religious site, uh, a sacred site where people go and worship and make sacrifices during droughts and things like that. And privatizing and privatizing it and directing a gate which now requires people to sign something before they can access that. There's a petition in Parliament which I'm part of uh, to try to use the historical lands in Justices Act. We just came into action a few years ago to try to see how we can reverse that. That's a story for another day, but that's how you, you I mean, the cultural heritage is lost uh, when you allow land to transform from historical owners to other forms.